Having been more in than out of jail since he was 17, the 31-year-old Reed claims the prison system is rife with gang warfare, a high-level drug trade, attempted suicides and self-mutilation. He says there was a $10,000 contract on his life and at least one attempt to murder him. And he's got the scars to prove it. That one there, that one down there, and that one there. The crisscross scars on my back. That happened when I broke out of Hayes Division with Jimmy Lufton and uh, Johnny Price, who later hung himself. And that one there was when I got stabbed in here. Ice pick in there. Ice pick for the back of the neck there. Listen. Chopper Reed says things weren't always bad. The gangs and the bashings have always been part of prison life, but Reed still talks with some affection about what he calls the good old days of Pentridge. It was the good old days in, in Pentridge. It's all junkies and uh, it, it, it's run by public service imbeciles now. But uh, there, there was, uh, for me, there were the good old days. I don't think the other prisoners would agree. But all that changed with Jika Jika. Opened in 1980, it's the most highly secure prison in Australia. A mass of computer-operated electronic security, it divides the inmates into isolated groups of six, a system that, according to the Challenger report, has an overall bad effect on long-stay prisoners. Mark Reed agrees. You actually start to believe um, that fiction or like, was, was reality. You know, everyone in the place was as mad as a march here, and... Um, and, then you, and, and I was as mad as a march here. So we all started looking at ourselves as being normal and everyone else as mad. In actual case, it was reverse. And what about the prison warders there? They were madder than we were. According to Reed, the mental pressure of Jika Jika turns men into psychopaths and leads to one of the more bizarre activities of the prison, self-mutilation. I started a group, a gang, called the Van Gogh Club. And to get into it, you had to cut off, cut off an, an ear, you know? It was pretty mental, but um, when you're in an insane situation, there's uh, um, one bloke cut his penis off, and then another bloke followed him, just just to get just to um, get out of Hayes Division or to or to um, get out of the situation they're in. When you can get a 357 Magnum smuggled into B Division, and when it, when they find a 38 Police Special in Hayes Division, and uh, I was running around with a pipe gun, uh, that, you know, with a shotgun shell in it, operated with a nut and a bolt. Now, there's no security. I used to get patted down in Pentridge and they'd put their hand on the axe under the coat and they'd just keep on going. So if that's security, I'd hate to see what a lack of security was. I'm 37 years old now. I'm, you know, I'm an old man. I don't do those things anymore. Those things he's referring to are a long list of ugly crimes. From petty rubbish to uh, murder, arson, malicious wounding. Has he given up a life of crime? Just four days after this interview, Mark Brandon Chopper Reed was once again arrested and charged, this time with attempted murder. It happened right here in Evandale, the tiny village in Tasmania that Chopper frequents to drink at the Clarendon Hotel. It is alleged Sydney Michael Collins left the hotel with Chopper and 15 minutes later, Collins was maliciously wounded. Could Chopper have done it? Well, he is one of Australia's most notorious criminals. Chopper then demonstrated the accuracy of his marksmanship. I'm a very, very good shot. Would, you like, good? would you like me to show you how good a shot I am? Yeah. All right, well, I'll get my young assistant, Trent, grab that bottle, get over there. This bloke's play by the hour. Once Chopper got started, there was no stopping him. You want me to have a go? Show you? Okay. Or show you? All right, hold it up clear. Hang on, just see if the gun works first. Oh, the gun works nicely. Yep, I'm a crack shot. So how long's it taken you to be a shot like that? Oh, well, most of my life. Chopper started a new life in Tasmania primarily because it has the laxest gun laws in the country. Why does he have so many guns? He claims there are as many as 25 contracts out on his life. There's two serious ones. Uh, the rest are all jokes, don't worry about them. The contracts that the Italians put out on me, uh, they're just good for a giggle. 
But it's not only for reasons of self-protection that Chopper insists on surrounding himself with so much weaponry. Because I have a, a great interest in keeping the rabbit population down. I feel it is my duty to keep the rabbit population down. I know a lot of, I know a lot of human rabbits too. <laughs> While in Pentridge Prison, Chopper alleges he cut off his own ears in an attempt to be removed from H Division. You don't have ears like Mickey Mouse, that's for sure. Can you tell us what happened to your ears? You're getting a bit personal there, aren't you? <laughs> if I shot you in the kneecap, Renee, we're entering Logie territory. <laughs> oh, you're the only journalist that's ever had a crack at my ears, you cheeky young bugger. And he was removed from H Division to hospital. Was it to prove a point to a warden? No, no, just to prove to get out of Haste Division. And then everyone else thought there was something in, uh, to be gained and and, uh, and they all started cutting off their ears and a couple of characters cut off their and uh, I bailed out of the gang. When the dicky birds start hitting the pavement, you know, I'm out. That's it, me, I'm gone, finished. Yet he had no problem oh. cutting off people's okay. toes. This was one of the tortures through which Chopper made money and a name for himself. I always thought the uh, removal of toes with a bolt cutter was rather humane. As I said to a mate of my line, Patrick Driscoll, who was head of a group called the Toe Cutters in the uh, late 60s and early 70s, I thought that uh, cutting people's toes off with a bolt cutter was rather puffy. Oh, you know, I, you know, I thought it was rather effeminate. Why is that? Oh, like a blowtorch, you know? The smell of burning flesh in the air. <laughs> he claims he's never tortured or murdered an innocent person. He says there was only one group he preyed upon. Scumbags, you know, basically people I didn't like, uh, drug dealers, heroin dealers, uh, people who, who had um, earned their living through uh, the sale of uh, heroin, made a lot of money, killed a lot of people. Uh, they had no right to the money. I had no money. So bugger them. Why should I stand on the footpath with me in, in my hand while these, these c oh, I shouldn't say that, should I? While these people drive past um, in their Mercedes coupes and uh, wearing twenty thousand dollar Rolex watches and uh, making a lot of money, why should I? Why should I have nothing while all these dagos and wogs and assorted, uh, you know, third world brown types uh, make a fortune out of heroin? Ever thought of getting a job? Oh, no, no. Perish the thought. No, I have applied for work. I have applied for work. Yeah. So how would you describe yourself? What is the job or trade you've been doing for the last 10 years? Or more? A garbage disposal. Mm. Garbage disposal. A sanitary engineer. <laughs> Tattoos are only part of the mutilation of Chopper's body. I got stabbed with a eight and a half inch butcher's knife here. What for? Uh, oh, well, you know, this. All sorts of things. Twice there, ice pick straight through the heart there. Stanley across there, Stanley knife across there, Stanley knife, Stanley knife, Stanley knife here, bullet hole here, ice pick here, Stanley knife. He's even tried to remove some of these tattoos with a blowtorch himself. The blowtorch was also his preferred instrument of torture. It's reasonably easy. He just takes a flame, a foot, <laughs> take the shoe off, give it a tickle. Love me to show you? I'd prefer it if you explained it. <laughs> <laughs> in his heyday in the Melbourne criminal underworld, Chopper played Russian roulette with a loaded gun for fun and money. And when I told Chopper I thought he was a sociopath... I'm not a sociopath at all. <laughs> Nothing wrong with me. <laughs> Five days after this interview, Reed was back in prison, charged with the attempted murder of Sidney Michael Collins. After two trials, he was convicted of a lesser charge and sentenced to the governor's pleasure, which means there is no date for release. All along, Reed has professed his innocence. On June 4 this year, he appealed his conviction, but Chopper is still behind bars, waiting to find out if he'll ever be free. He rang me from jail and gave this one interview. It's none of it adds up. Sid Collins claims he was shot by me and then raced at 100 miles an hour to hospital. Why would I shoot someone and then race them to hospital? I mean, taking them to hospital defeats the entire purpose of shooting them. Uh, if I shot Sid Collins, the only part of the hospital he would be seeing would be the big fridge underneath the hospital. 
A jury decided that this gun and this man shot Sid Collins. But what does the convict have to say? No, I didn't do it. No, I didn't shoot him. But the thing is, he was shot with a gun that I was using on national television in an interview I did with you about a week before. Why would I shoot someone with the same gun I was using on national television? According to the court, Sidney Michael Collins was shot in the chest with a hollow point bullet from this gun while he sat in the back of this car. Collins was then driven to hospital in the same car and miraculously lived to tell the tale. He says Chopper shot him. <laughs> Chopper tells a different story. Uh, I don't shoot people and then whiz them off to hospital. Wouldn't anyone in your position plead not guilty just to have a go at getting off? Why not plead not guilty on the grounds of self-defence? Yeah. The gun, I mean, that car was littered with guns. There was a 410 sort of shotgun under the front seat. There was a 357 Magnum in the boot. Um, there was two fully loaded guns up the back of the car. There was another gun in the glove box. I could have shot him in the brain and put a gun in his hand and said it was self-defence. There's a hundred ways to do something um, with guns and, and get away with it. There may be a hundred ways, but this wasn't one of them. According to Reed, a Crown witness said the gun used to shoot Sid Collins was hidden in Chopper's backyard. I can't believe that any sane jury could believe that, that, that I would be stupid enough to hide the gun in my own backyard. To top it off, it's insulting. It's, it's insulting. I mean, not only are they claiming I've shot him, but they're saying that you know, I'm the only gunman that, that supplies a medical plan. Not only do I shoot you, but I take you to hospital as well. I mean, I should be given some sort of humanitarian award. Why would Sid lie about who shot him? I think whatever happened to Sid Collins was um, related to the motorcycle world. And for some reason, they've decided to dump it all off onto me. I mean, big deal. A bullet through the guts never hurt anyone. I mean, who cares? I would just plead guilty and say, yes, I shot him. Go on, give me a couple of years. Off I go. Who cares? But I've been sitting in the remand yard for 12 months. I've had two trials. I'm going up to an appeal, you know. I will keep fighting this and keep fighting this. I mean, we're not talking about the Kennedy assassination. This is the shooting of some insignificant, dribbling little As well as touting his newfound innocence, Chopper still claims he has never hurt a law-abiding citizen. That's why he says he is against any proposed legislation that wants the money from the sale of his books to go to the victims of crime. Now, if you're going to return money to the victims of crime, well then, who are my victims? I've got no little old ladies or innocent people as my victims. What are you going to run around giving money back to drug dealers? You know, all my victims are scumbags and assholes. You know, I, I, I couldn't care less about my victims. They're all rat bags. He's working on a third book due for release in November. He's also negotiating movie rights with a Sydney film company. But it could be a long, long time before we see Chopper Reed in front of the cameras again. I could win the appeal, but I, I keep saying to myself, why should I be so lucky? Any peanut, any bottom-wiping idiot who wants to go into the drug world can become a millionaire and a powerful figure simply because simply because he gets a right connection over in Bangkok, brings the drugs back, sells it to the googie eggs and makes plenty of money. Next thing you know, he's walking around nightclubs flashing his gold and his, his beautiful clothes and he's driving a Porsche. And... There's, a, there's a few things we all regret in your life. But generally speaking, I regret nothing. I didn't grow up wanting to be in the criminal world. My mother brought me up to be a strict seven day Venice since I was 15. Religion can drive you mad. Chopper Reed became an underworld executioner. He also became known for his colourful body and personality. Not to mention his loyalty to friends like fellow prison inmate and mentor, Billy the Texan Longley. I was in the scullery there and a, a white-faced prison officer came up to me with a plastic bag. He said, Bill, he said, uh, would you put these in the freezer for me? We'd chop his ears. After losing your ears, you'd think you'd be uh, a little bit on the downside, but not Chopper. He was laughing and chuckling about it all. It was all to try and get out of bloody H division. I didn't realise that the ears were going to bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed and not stop. I thought that they'd, I thought if Van Gogh did it hundreds of years ago and he lived, Nothing, nothing's working. 
and uh, you got prison officers running around, guns at blokes' heads, and uh, prisoners screaming and shouting, and uh, everything that can be broken gets broken, and uh, I think it's, it's just a, a really rough situation. And thanks to a lot, you did chop a chuck leg and laughing his head off at what was going on. In 1986, Chopper was released from prison and tried life on the other side of the law. He became a police informant working with former armed robbery squad detective we Brian had, Cook. Um, he's involved in the cops and robbers type environment and we needed informants. Um, we were getting 12 bank robberies a week. We needed to get them solved. In return, Chopper was provided with a bulletproof vest. Uh, he was given that vest prior to information we received from another source that uh, he perhaps his life was in danger. And we needed him on the street more than um, needed him dead. So we provided him with a vest. While wearing that vest, Chopper shot a drug dealer dead and was later acquitted on the grounds of self-defence. After his release in 1991, he vowed never to return to jail. In 1992, he was convicted of assault and declared a dangerous criminal to be detained indefinitely. To this day, Chopper remains in Tasmania's Risdon prison, protesting his innocence. Because of the charges that are held, uh, alleged against him, um, I felt that that was just totally wrong. It wasn't, it wasn't something that Mark would have done. It's not his style to shoot someone in the stomach and then rush him off to hospital. That's just not his style. Chopper's style these days is more artistic. He paints and over the last six years has written his memoirs. While Reed's legal team seeks his release, this notorious inmate says he's left the bad old days behind and is ready to go straight. Still, he says he has no regrets and no sympathy for those he's tortured and killed. It's the world they lived in, it's the game they decide to play. They got beaten at their own game. Je ne regret rien. I regret nothing. I do think it's outrageous. It's, a, it's an abuse of the penal system and uh, it, it sends all the wrong messages. This is an, um, Chopper Is this Chopper Is one? I've read, his, I've read his autobiography, so... So would you want to copy this? Oh, would, yeah. Yeah, I would, actually. It's very good. The man who admits to bashing, belting, iron barring, shooting, stabbing and kneecapping criminals for a living Mark Brandon Chopper Reed is trading in on his infamous reputation yet again. The underworld killer who's already written six best-selling novels is venturing into the world of music by releasing his first CD. He's rehabilitated now. He's Australia's most prolific earless author that we've ever known um, musically. I think he's, he's got more creative talent than um, you know, most of the Australian music industry popped into a couple of socks. Chopper Reed's teamed up with Melbourne music entrepreneur Colin Dix. But the man who's also responsible for the Ruxton rap is not divulging how the tracks were recorded in Hobart's Risdon prison earlier this year. It was a very difficult process to go about doing and um, one which my memory tends to fade rather quickly when I'm asked about it. The Smell of Love CD will be released under the name Chopper Reed and the Blue Flames. The lyrics and music were penned by Mark Reed from his Risdon prison cell and smuggled out to Colin, who mixed the tracks over eight months in his Melbourne studio. You know, basically we're putting the back into rock and roll. Uh, Mark is rock and roll and he leaves everything else in its wake. The self-confessed killer, arsonist and standover man Chopper Reed has recorded more than 40 tracks in the privacy of his cell. Colin Dick says that's enough for four albums over the next three years. <laughs> he's laughing at the justice system. Uh, he's laughing at um, communication community concern for what he's done. Well, basically, we're the 90s version of air supply, except we don't have skivvies on, and um, we've got a little bit more attitude. This is going to be the greatest deception of all time if you want to sell it as music. Um, like, give it away, Chopper, you, you're just a fool. You're an absolute nutter idiot. While the release of Chopper's CD is still weeks away, controversy has already erupted about Reed's musical recordings. 
Victoria Police Association Secretary Danny Walsh has heard enough. Losing off, but I've heard enough. Not that one there. Does it uh, concern you that the first track we played you, which is called Hangster the Gangster, actually is called the Spank Fat Boy Danny Dub? What's your response to that? No response at all. You know, you wouldn't give him two minutes of your time. And this is about getting Chopper out of jail. Don't worry about that. He's cunning enough to want to be outside those walls and he'll do anything to do it. And he's, he wants to make money on the way through. The Australian Family Association has also condemned the project. Vice President Mary Helen Woods is outraged. And it is very much sending out the wrong messages to allow a convicted murderer to become a sort of musical celebrity. Holland Dix hopes to find a record company which will release a CD to coincide with Mark Reed's possible release from prison. He's recently applied to the Tasmanian Supreme Court to have his dangerous classification lifted. Today Tonight took the CD to the streets, only to find the people it's aimed at had very different opinions. Do you know who it is? Is it uh, that? Pro uh, uh, Progeny, I think it is. Boring initially. Sounds like a, a copy of Prince. Silver chair. Oh no, I think it's pretty cool. I do you? Really, yeah, I seriously do. Even though he's a criminal? Um, well, that doesn't come into it. It's pretty the sound like to you. I would probably say, you know, a couple of kids are mucking around in the garage. But we haven't heard the last of Chopper. There's now a movie in the making. And that story was produced by Rochelle Jackson, who says Russell Crowe is tipped to play Chopper in the upcoming movie. Mark Reed's appearance in court lasted less than a minute. When the decision was announced, the reaction was swift. Reed hugging his barrister, saying, good on you, Michael. Mr. Reed is very, very happy. Um, he's very pleased with the result and, as I said, he sends his best wishes to all of you. Reed, who's serving a six-year jail term for shooting a man in the stomach, was being held indefinitely after being classified a dangerous criminal. In today's judgment, Chief Justice William Cox said two psychiatrists had found Reed had matured and was no longer a threat. He said while no one can give any guarantee that he will not expose the public to the danger of some form of violent crime, the prospects are sufficiently slight and his indefinite incarceration is no longer warranted. Uh, should any other act of violence be committed by this man, then obviously he, he would be confronted with the prospect of a similar declaration. Reed's wife didn't appear in court to hear the decision, but friend Bill Watson said she was pleased. Overdue. Reed, who released a CD earlier this week, is working on his eighth book about his criminal exploits. He's eligible to apply for parole immediately, but may wait until his sentence expires next February so he can be released without conditions. Reed will remain here in medium security at Risdon Prison until he decides whether or not to apply for parole. Through his lawyers, he said that like Oscar Wilde, he'd done some of his best writing in jail. Sally Pickering in Hobart for National 9 News. Mate, you wake up in the morning, wrong song comes to the radio, you don't think it happened. <laughs> in 92, now free again. After a night drinking and gambling at Hobart's Rest Point Casino, Reed says the life of crime is now behind him. My enemies are dropping by like flies but from natural causes. Uh, what have I got to worry about? Let's stay over here in the country life and write books. Reed believes divine intervention brought about the death of sworn enemy and Melbourne crime boss Alphonse Gangitano. Now, for years I've been getting down on my hands and knees and I've been saying, Dear God, please kill elephants. And that proves that the, the, the Lord answers prayer, doesn't it? The once feared gunman is not daunted by speculation. Yeah. Other criminals are now out to get him. I can't see any of them. Where are they? They're all swearing to kill me. I think I'm going to die of old age waiting for it to happen. You're not concerned about all the speculation that the bikey gangs are out to get you? No, no. In, in a thinking contest, they're so far behind the county of the van plane, so I'm not really worried about that. Reed, sporting what he said was the only set of cobalt chrome false teeth in Australia, provided by Risdon Jail, said he was baffled by the titles put on crime figures. Isn't it funny, you know, you can sell a heroin for 17 years, and when you die you get called a colourful character. 
you can shoot heroin dealers and you get called a psychopathic monster. Reed says he has no regrets about his life of crime, but he says he's now looking forward to the quiet life with new wife Mary Ann and writing more books. If people shoot me in the streets, my book sales are going to go through the roof. They'll be doing me a favour. You know, so, you know, <laughs> I can't lose. Readjusting to life outside prison, Reed spent his first night at the casino with wife Mary Ann. Polished off a bottle of vodka, went to the casino. I think I won on the night. I gave my winnings to my wife and now she's not telling me how much I won. But his newfound freedom hasn't stopped the self-confessed killer taking aim at his former underworld enemies, among them Alphonse Gangitano. He's accused the underworld figure murdered last month of being responsible for a major heroin network in Victoria. 25 to 30 per cent of all the heroin that went through Melbourne from 1980 to 19, uh, 1997 passed through Alphonse's hands. Keith Reid spoke to his son this morning after receiving a threatening phone call and says he's prepared to take whatever action is necessary to protect himself. I, think I can handle it and my trigger finger works very well, even if I am 74. Police have told Reid his life has been threatened by motorcycle gangs in Hobart, but the notorious criminal says he's not afraid of a payback. I'll die of old age waiting for those knuckleheads to kill me. Reid, who has vowed to go straight, plans to spend his time on his successful book writing career while a major film on his life is due to begin production later this year. Karen Half National, Nine News. A standover man who, by his own account, had a role in the deaths of 19 people, he says that side of his life is now over. He only wants to write about it. Rachel Friend went to Tasmania for this exclusive interview with Chopper Reed, and I should point out that no money was involved. This program does not pay criminals. Yeah, well, God gave us a brain, you know, like, well, all right, I've, I've, I've wasted my entire life, virtually half of it in jail and the other half in blood, guts and total insanity. But I've got a small spark of intelligence that's kept me from a life sentence. You know, what, should I be condemned for that? As I walked down the shower, some young bugger said, we were all Chopper and his tattoos, mate. It seems remarkable, but Mark mm. Chopper oh, Reed nice. is now a free man. Thoroughly deserved to die. He brags about having a hand in at least 19 deaths. Six years ago, he was locked up indefinitely by the Tasmanian government, who declared him a dangerous criminal. But now Reed's convinced the authorities that he's changed. <laughs> know thy enemy and know a little bit more than he does. <laughs> you laugh, but people want to know, have you changed? The leopard don't change his spots, but the leopard does grow older and tighter. And as he grows older and tighter, he changes his habits. We heard you turned over a new leaf back in 91 and 12 months later you were back in jail. Yeah. So why should we believe you now? What? Because of some... A uh, bikey leader got shot. Oh, well. I think he benefited from, from the experience, personally, like they got shot. Oh, I, I think he's a dead set psychopath. Sid Collins well, has been in hiding well, since killed. Chopper's shot and narrowly anyone. missed killing him. I've never been scared of Chopper. He's always worried me a little, but I've never been scared of him. He shot me, he nearly killed me. I thought I died. So I've already been through death, the way I look at it. I do worry about my family and my friends, though. Why should you be let free when other people are serving time? Well, I'll, well, after this interview's over, on the strength of what you've said, I'll just go to the bathroom and hang myself. Well, what, what can I do? You know? What am I, am I supposed to apologise for, um, for, um, getting out of jail? apologise for uh, remaining alive when a lot of people think I should have been killed years ago. I don't think anybody will ever be satisfied that he's not a danger to the community. Nobody ever could be. Danny Walsh from the Victorian Police Association does not believe Reid's reformed. The community should be concerned, but there are certain rules in place and if the rules are being met then then he's entitled to be released. There's no question about that. <laughs> Reed has spent 23 of his 43 years inside Australian prisons, and during his last stint inside Hobart's Risdon Jail, he turned his notoriety into celebrity by penning a number of novels and releasing a CD. But despite his acclaim, Reed has his fair share of enemies. Many years ago, I had a lot of people saying they're going to kill me, going to hurt me, going to do this and that. And I thought, rightio. 
So I cut the ears off and I said, this is what I can do to myself. You think you, think you can do worse to me? It was all tactical psychology, just to freak him out. How seriously do you take the death threats you've received? I haven't got many friends, but the few friends I have got, um, I'm no, no longer involved in crime, but they are, and they are extremely serious people. So if I was to drop dead tomorrow of the common cold, um, believe me, someone would pay for it. Reid claims he's no ordinary criminal. According to him, his career of violence was almost a bizarre form of community service. I've never hurt an innocent member of the community. I don't bash and rape old grannies. I don't pinch people's cars and television sets and videos. I don't break into people's houses and do nasty, nasty things in their sinks and, and ravage their homes. I don't rape people's virgin daughters. But if you make a, a great deal of money out of heroin and you come to my attention, and I think to myself, hmm, Giuseppe, you've made a lot of money, haven't you, over the last 10 years out of heroin? I might knock on your door and ask for a few, Bob. Well, is that so bad? Yet Reed now insists he's too old for that. He says he wants the quiet life of a country writer. Well, today at least. What are the values here? Do we hold this person up as a, a role model for children? Do we hold this person up uh, to say there's something glorious about committing crime? Because the reality is he wasn't even a good crim. 23 out of uh, 43 years behind bars would indicate he's not even good at what he does. Do you think you are sane? I don't know. I know a lot about psychiatry and psychology, and I, 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 um, I know I've got problems. <laughs> the bizarre appearance of the self-confessed killer has caused outrage among political and community leaders. From the moment the career criminal walked onto the set of Al McPhee's show, it was clear it wasn't going to be a run-of-the-mill interview. And Mark Chopper Reed, released from Hobart Prison just a few weeks ago, soon confirmed he was drunk. Shut up! Shut up! You, know, you bring me on here, you piss as a parrot. You ask me questions. I'm obviously drunk. No use to anybody. <laughs> Chopper Reed, who later admitted he'd been on a drinking binge between Hobart and Sydney, also leered at McFeast. They're my breasts, they're implants. <laughs> After a seating change, Reed laughed about an associate who shot dead the wrong man. That was a funny story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was very sad. ABC management describes the incident as a lapse in judgment that won't happen again. But that hasn't stopped critics of the drunken interview lining up to have their say. When you promote this sort of thing, I think you make murder a laughing matter. And it's not a laughing matter. I was personally appalled at that El McFeast material. And that particular segment was in extraordinarily bad taste. Today, Reid apologised to McFeast. I totally humiliated myself. Drunk as a skunk. Chopper Reed, in fact, uh, agreed to come on midday today, today to discuss the incident. But uh, we debated it quite ha hotly and harshly in the office this morning, and we've decided not to go ahead with the interview with Chopper Reed live on this program. I guess it's what you call a value judgment, but we took the high moral ground. There was a lot of heated debate about it. We might be wrong, but the question remains, I think, the question to be asked is, should a convicted killer and torturer be given publicity or not? To discuss the issue, we welcome broadcaster Alan Jones. Welcome, Alan Jones. And I know this is very short notice, so we really appreciate uh, your time. As I mentioned in the introduction, We've taken a, uh, a high moral ground in not putting Chopper Reed on television. What was your view of what happened on the ABC on El McFeast's program on Monday night? Well, it could only happen on the ABC, and, and taxpayers fund that sort of stuff, and I think 
responsible and decent Australians who are taxpayers find that whole treatment absolutely horrific and appalling. And I think they're disgusted and revolted by it, and I think they're entitled to be. The purpose, basically, of a broadcast of any kind is to entertain and inform, and an interview with Chopper Reed, in my view, doesn't come into any of those categories. You see, at the moment, there's a culture out there where people, the kind of people in your audience and elsewhere, are absolutely horrified at the level of violence in this community and the extent to which people are violated themselves and their property. And to give some kind of person like this celebrity status and to be boasting about how difficult he found it when some one of the victims was murdered and they wouldn't fit in the box and the host starts to laugh, she actually finds that amusing. I think there's got to be something wrong with you when you actually think that sort of stuff's funny. I had a degree of difficulty this morning and there was a degree of awkwardness about saying to the people I cherish and work with that I have a big problem talking to this person. A person who has boasted about making victims swallow razor blades, who boasts about blowtorching mm -hmm. somebody's feet. And I'm going, why should we give this person well, we don't. We any don't. space? Well, and, we don't. I you mean, know, you go, well, we're a commercial broadcaster. Somebody says to me, well, but it's newsworthy. And people will be riveted. Is that well, I mean, a fellow shot himself on American television a couple of years ago and it was newsworthy. But I don't think the people here want to see that sort of stuff. And I think that we've reached a point where we have to actually take a stand. I mean, these things encourage people to believe that if you want to get, get yourself on the Kerry Ann Kennelly show, the midday show, then perhaps you do what Chopper Reed's done. After all, there are thousands and thousands of thoroughly decent people, law abiding mm -hmm. Australians, never get within bull's roar of this program. So if to get here, it means you've got to. Uh, chew someone up and mm. laugh about it and tell the world about it. I mean, it's a pretty strange old world when those sorts of people are celebrated in any way. But on the other hand, the argument, which I think has legitimacy, this is a man who, even though convicted, has served his time. He is a free man like mm, sure. um, Alan we Jones don't, we don't and Kerry Kennelly. Why do, we have to talk, why do we have to talk about all of this stuff? See, it's reached a point in our community where we are really anaesthetising people to the view that, oh, well, perhaps this happens or this goes on. Well, it doesn't have to happen. You see, there's a real problem also about the whole way in which entertainment is presented to, to the community today. Alan, I don't want to interrupt you, but um, uh, Rowdy, our floor manager over there, is just holding up a sign. Uh, if you'd like to look at that. Chopper's on um, the phone. Well, we, we, in fact, uh, were going to talk to Chopper Reed from Hobart this morning, and we cancelled that. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has um, called in, uh, and this because we did cancel it this morning, um, I'm just trying to figure out whether we actually it's your show. It. <laughs> it's your show, but, Kerry. Uh, I'm not the producer <clears throat> of the show. Would you feel comfortable in talking to him or no? It's your show. No, well, I wouldn't want to embarrass anybody. You but don't I'm embarrass not... me. I'll tell Chopper Reed what he... I think of Chopper Reed. <laughs> yeah. We don't have to do this, but uh, shall we? You're the boss. I mean, it's up to the audience. Chopper Reed is on the phone, ladies and gentlemen. Should... Give him a chance to speak up for himself? OK, well... Chopper Reed, uh, you're on the phone from where? Hobart? Hobart, uh, yeah, I'm here. Um, you've heard... I assume you've uh, been watching the television. You've heard what we had to say. Um, what's... What's your feeling on the furor about whether someone like yourself, who many people think shouldn't be out of jail, to get any public exposure? Well, 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 well so what? Like that got put into the uh, cement mixer was a heavy duty heroin dealer, right? He killed more people than I'd, I'd ever kill in my wildest dreams. But is, I'm well, sorry, hey, Chopper, well, 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 is Chopper, it good yeah, enough hey. to say you only kill bad guys? Is no, that that's an not even the issue. That's not even the issue. There are law enforcement authorities in this country who are responsible for dealing with heroin dealers. It is not the responsibility of any Australian citizen to think that he can go and chop people up and murder them because they deal in heroin. Otherwise, we'd have the law of the jungle prevailing and everyone would be the custodian of the law. I mean, that is a nonsense. If we turn the society to a situation where people please themselves about how they deal with those whom they don't like, then who is to be the next victim? Yeah. People who throw stones better make sure they don't live in glass houses, Alan. Well, we're not talking about anyone living in glass houses, Chopper. Yeah, well, I never got arrested in a public toilet in London. Yeah. Oh, oh we're Chopper, we're I'm sorry. I actually, I'm now pulling the plug on this. I actually have no desire to listen to anything else uh, that you have to say. Thank you very much for calling. That's as polite as I can possibly be. Um, and 
I think the whole issue uh, in terms of violence on television, I'd let you wrap it up. Maybe we can talk about uh, The Boy From Oz show after this. Well, I mean, that's the point. Uh, in, in relation to um, the final comment, of course, by Chopper Reed, I guess that indicates the kind of person we're dealing mm. with. Um, justice takes its course in all things, mm. and uh, you don't dignify those, but those sorts of things by any kind of remark. But I'd just simply say this, that there are two sides have already been evidenced about Australia in the last 15 minutes on this program. One side is the exciting cap capacity of young people to do outstanding things, and we don't salute that often enough, your program does. The other is to deal in the macabre and the circumstances whereby we somehow are entertained by a whole culture and a spectre of violence that happens via stabbing and all the rest of it. And I think decent people out there are absolutely horrified by that sort of behaviour. And I'm just simply saying to them, they should maintain that sense of anxiety and horror. I think the tide is turning. I think eventually where New York could achieve a zero attitude towards tolerance, a zero tolerance towards crime, they wouldn't mm -hmm. tolerate anything. I think we are moving in that direction where people are going to themselves say to those people who make the rules, look, we must make them in support of the law-abiding citizens, we must mm. make them in support of those people who oppose violence, and all we do, in whatever way we're doing it, should be directed towards that end. And that's why these people shouldn't be given a forum. Do you agree, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> well, I can only say that it is up to Australians, you people sitting in the audience, and to Australians, if you see a person like a chopper read on there, they are the ones that actually have to make a moral decision. I mean, we discussed it and we made that decision this morning. We pull the plug on, uh, on talking to him, but it's up to Australians. So how else can they help, Alan, though? Well, uh, the ABC is funded by us uh, in any other circumstance, that sort of stuff. And I might add that language wouldn't be allowed. I have great difficulty with the sort of language that passes as acceptable on the ABC and radio and television, which if it were used on this program, in this type, particular time mm. slot, you'd have the Broadcasting Authority climbing over the top of you. Mm. I don't understand why rules apply to this station which don't apply to the ABC. Mm. And um, that's always been a dilemma for everybody. Mm. In ABC radio, some of the language that is used in some of those programs is offensive to every decent Australian. Mm. Chopper Reed says he's only ever had two reliable income sources, his gun and his pen. What am I going to do, get a job as a cleaner? Who's going to hire me? Oh, excuse me, there's a no-eared bed at the door wanting a job. Am I, am I going to get a job? I could do two things. I can go back to what I used to do or write books. That's the only thing I know. Reed says his provocative style and violent history has sold 330,000 paperbacks. But the Law Reform Commission says that's profiting from crime. A new inquiry questions whether federal proceeds of crime legislation should be widened, forcing Reid and others like him to forfeit money from crime books, films and media interviews. There's very limited capacity to provide compensation from uh, criminal profits for the victims. I've, I've shot a few two Bob bloody heroin dealers, you know. Oh, if their parents contact me, I'll give them a few, Bob. When Reed left jail three months ago, he says he had $600 to his name, the profits of his eight books spent on lawyers. But he says he'll always write, regardless of the money. I think they just don't like the fact that I write books. But what about the perpetrators of crime? He's mainly talking about whether or not, I suppose, people like you should be able to write books and profit from what you've done. Uh... Well, you've got me in a moral dilemma, you know. I'm caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. Oh, the victims of my crime are all heroin dealers. Now, if their parents would like to contact you and give me their names and addresses, I'll go over to Melbourne and I'll make well and surely true they're bloody compensated. You know, I've got no problem with that. OK, but, but, but the other issue, of course, is whether or not you should be able to profit by writing books. But I write crime fiction books. Yeah, but you started out writing anecdotal books, didn't you? Yeah, and I got into a lot of trouble over it, and they're all used against me at court, and I got five years, nine months as a direct result of me bloody books. So I've, done 20, I've done 23 years in jail. I've paid my sins. And you don't necessarily think that there's anything wrong with your sins uh, paying you a reasonable amount of money in return? Now, look, look, if I'd hurt a child, a woman, an old person, an innocent member of the community, OK, you could bag me till the cows come home. But uh, everything I did was internal. It was within the criminal world, right? The only people I hurt were smack dealers and professional criminals, right? Now, uh, if their families are upset about that, their families should have told them, don't get involved in crime. 
you see crime and uh, the television industry is very much alike. Every now and again, you get the axe. Do you think that criminals should have to forfeit the proceeds of their crimes? And let me give you an example. If, if someone goes out and robs a bank and gets $100,000 and they get caught, should they have to give up the $100,000? Of course. Okay, so if someone goes out and robs a bank and writes a book about it and gets paid $100,000 for writing the book, where's the difference? Yes, yes. If, if, he's only, if, any, if he's writing about a bank robbery, see, yeah, I sort of, yeah, I do agree with you, but in my case, I was writing about myself in conjunction with a hundred other people my entire life. So you think it makes, you think that there's a line to be drawn about what sort of crime is committed or where, where are Tracy, we going here? You've got to, how's the wording of this legislation going to be done? You know, Henry Lawson uh, was a derelict, an alcoholic who spent most of his life in and out of Darlinghurst Jail, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if this legislation had been around then, there'd be no Henry Lawson. Okay, there's another moral question too. Remember years ago when the world media, the entire world media, uh, led by Rupert Murdoch, who had his nose straight in the trough, was going to pay bulk money for Adolf Hitler's bloody diaries, right? Now, the fact they turned out to be fake was beside the point. Uh, now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Adolf killed one or two, didn't he? Now, what about Hollywood? and uh, the, the international television, literary community and movie uh, community have made bulk billions of dollars on the life, death and times of Adolf Hitler. Now, ha have those people paid one penny to the survivors of the Holocaust? You know, it, it, you've got to draw a line in the sand, you know? Uh, okay, they're very valid points. Can I, can I ask you this? How do you perceive that you have made your money? Do you, do you consider that you have made your, the money that you've made out of writing books, do you consider you've made it because you're a good writer or do you consider you've made it because you're a convicted criminal? Well, th 330,000 people don't buy books because the bloke that wrote them can't tell a story. Obviously, somebody likes what I'm writing. So I get letters from little old ladies, grandmothers, little kids, mums and dads. All my books contain a very strong anti-drug message. Okay. And uh, the uh, ordinary bloke on the street, he's got nothing against me. So you're saying then that you're not necessarily making the money, you, you, the money that's come to you as a result of your books isn't necessarily as a, as a result of your crimes, what it's money? as a result I, I of your ability. I walked out of Risdom Prison with $600. All my money went on legal fees. I didn't get no legal aid. Well, that's another issue here that's going to be looked at at this inquiry, and you probably know. It's also going to be examined whether or not these, th those sorts of proceeds of crime, if we call those proceeds of crime, should be used to pay legal costs. I reckon this, right? If a, a, a man gets convicted, he's a major heroin dealer, major drug dealer, he's a big money criminal, as soon as he gets convicted, everything he owns should be frozen until he's proved either uh, innocent or guilty. You know? Mm -hmm. well, so that would be Defending the case. bloody self. That would, be, that would be the case in your case if, for example, and I know that you're a reformed man these days, but if, for example, you were to take a backward step, you would be happy for all of your assets to be frozen? I'd defend myself. I'd walk in a co uh, court sober, I'd defend myself. <laughs> I'm never going to pay another bloody lawyer again. Oh. So we'd have to say then, Mark, we'd have to assume that you are not a wealthy man even after I'm all of those best sellers. I'm not a wealthy man. So all the money's Everyone imagines I'm a wealthy man because I, I write a few silly books. <laughs> the... I live in a rented premises, right? I've got 600 bucks in my back pocket and that's all the bloody money I've got. That's it. That's my whack. Can I ask you this? If the pen was taken out of your hands, if, for example, it was no longer profitable for you to write, and I know you're working on another book, would yeah. you replace the pen with a gun? Would you have to? I've How... done two things in my life, right? I've shot smack dealers and I've written books. And that's the only two things I know to do, right? I can't drive a car, I haven't got a driver's licence, I'm virtually unemployable. If I knocked on the doors of Channel 9 and said, give me a job, you, you'd call the police, right? So, the pen is mighty of the sword. I've taken up the pen and left the sword behind. But I could make more money with a gun than I ever could with a pen. Could you? I can do more damage with a pen than I ever did with a gun, but I can make more money with the gun. Okay, well, you're writing your next book, what's it going to be about? It's called the Sicilian Defence. So it's the truth about the so-called Australian Mafia. 
So we can assume then you're not going to be turning to romance novels? A bug of romance novels, you know. Barbara Cartler can have them. Oh, Keith, you know, I always thought I was a good bloke. What? <laughs> What'd you ever do that was good? Well, I bet you. <laughs> that was good, wasn't it? Oh, come on, Keith. You should thank me. You got a head that needs regular panel beating. Mark Chopper Reed has become something of a celebrity. He likens himself to a modern day Ned Kelly. Not bad for a bloke who made his reputation as a violent and ruthless standover merchant. No oh, shirt, son. What's wrong with that? <laughs> Nothing, it's good. I like it. You like it? They make them for men. <laughs> I was a less than average crook who used greater than average violence for less than below average money. But, but, uh. But then again, Ned Kelly wasn't the greatest bushranger in Australian history. When I agreed to do this film, they promised no tattoos. In the controversial no film to be released next week, day. Chopper is played by former stand-up comedian Eric Banner. If I was to enter a Chopper Reed look-alike contest with Eric Banner, I would lose. That's how, that's how good he took me off. Why make a hero out of someone who's really the scourge of society? Hi, how are you? Victoria Police Senior Sergeant Paul Mullet describes Chopper's stories as fiction. He's urging a boycott of the movie. Uh, we'd suggest that uh, people stay away from this type of movie. They're, uh, they're far better to go and watch the adventures of Tigger rather than the adventures of Chopper. Get the camera over to Bucky. Bucky, get over here. Here he is, young Bucky. Show her your tattoo, Buck. Hoik it up. King Kong, well, why has he got that? Voila, coffee cat. Isn't that bloody pathetic? If you want to be like your Uncle Chop Chop, get them bloody ears off your f***. Oh, sorry, get them bloody ears off. Eric Banner spent two days on Chopper's Tasmanian farm studying his every mannerism. Get, 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 get the, don't worry about Bucky, just get the camera over here. If you go and see this movie, and at the end of this movie, you would rather be in Chopper's shoes, I think I'd feel really sorry for you. I really would. The real Chopper describes the film as 95% accurate. He mostly laughs at his on-screen exploits, but cringes yeah, at a honey. scene in which he assaults his then girlfriend and her mother. I wasn't terribly comfortable with that scene. But you're happy to be and, seen uh, shooting a, an enemy in the eye that <laughs> raising a fist to a woman makes you uncomfortable. I, 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 I didn't feel all that good about that, no. Mark Reed's critics refuse to watch the film and say they're even offended by Chopper's decision to donate all his proceeds from the film to a police charity for sick children. It appealed to my sense of humour for me to donate the money to them because if this movie goes big enough, I could end up becoming their largest contributor. I think the average victim of crime would feel sick in the stomach Mel Burnett represents victims of crime. Like the police, he describes the movie as a bad joke, including Reed's donation to the police-run charity. I'd be rather offended by the fact that money is going to be given somewhat charitably from a criminal to the organisation from the profits of his crime. Maybe if I was a victim of crime, I wouldn't want to watch it either. So at the end of the day, I don't personally have a problem with people who have a problem with it. You Banner know, is passionate about the film. He says it doesn't portray Mark Reed as a hero. In some cases, he claims it's quite the opposite. And remember, the film is, is Chopper through somebody else's eyes. It's not Chopper through his eyes. It's, it's a Chopper Reed through the eye of the director, and it's, there's a big difference. We love Charlie Reed. We love Charlie Reed. Perhaps not surprisingly, Chopper says, after spending 23 of his 46 years in prison, he's finally cleaned up his act and now concentrates on playing husband and father. If it wasn't for my wife, I suppose I'd be back in jail. You know. And your son, how's he changed? Uh, yeah, you? Yeah, well, that's, that's it, you know, my whole life now. He, he, he is my whole life. That's it, you know. And so, um, you know, what, as far as I'm concerned, Chopper Reed's dead. He's, he's gone. He's finished. He's over. You know, Chopper Reed exists now on film, in books, and in the minds of uh, people that like me and people that don't like me. But the the real actual chopper reed has gone, he's finished. Just listen to this. I'll give you 20 seconds to produce some cash or I'll shoot you. There's no cash here. Here, there's no cash, all right? I used to love doing this. <laughs> Despite his claims of transformation, 
Chopper Reed clearly has some affection for his brutal past. I have drink no. with <laughs> He's nothing but a convicted criminal. Why put someone up on a pedestal who's uh, got convictions for uh, extremely serious offences and has done uh, uh, lengthy terms of imprisonment? Do you think it's going to be a success? Yes, this is going to be, this is going to be bigger than Texas. Glenn Conley in Melbourne with that. And police say they do take some comfort from the fact that Chopper the movie will be R-rated and restricted to adults. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a slug in this gun. Now, you've got to take my word for it, but there's a slug in this gun. Well, I want one shot to my head. One shot to Renee's. Are you ready, Renee? I don't think I want to play. Are you ready? You don't want to play. Bad luck. 